Now, um, the book that I brought uh, gives fuller details than I'm able to give in a 50-minute talk. Um, so possibly some of you will be interested to have a look at it afterwards, and if anyone wants to buy one, I could deal with that at the end of the lecture. Um, because I have to cut down, really, and simplify what I can say to you in just an hour. But I'm looking at the story of somebody that I'm calling the Dublin King, um, and how that connects to the stories of three princes in the tower. The Dublin King was the third crowned Yorkist King of England. You can see I've used the Society of Antiquaries two portraits, um, Edward IV and Richard III. Um, but they don't have the portrait of the Dublin King, unfortunately. Um, but these were the only three crowned Yorkist kings of England. So who was this person? He's a bit of a mystery. Version one of this story says that he was a Yorkist prince, and um, this Yorkist prince was crowned in England uniquely in Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin. It's not very many English kings that have been crowned in Ireland. He was the only one. Um, this unique event that he was, he was a Yorkist prince who was crowned king. And the versions of the story that we have as reported by the Tudor government, which was then in power in England, suggests that he used the name Richard or Edward. Now we'll explore this in a bit more detail in a moment. But first of all, let's just check which young Yorkist princes were in existence in 1486, when this Dublin king first appeared on the scene, um, and so who might he have been claiming to be? Well, the senior branch of the Yorkist royal family consisted of three brothers. Edward IV, the eldest brother, middle brother, George, Duke of Clarence, youngest brother, Richard III. And Richard had no living <coughs> legitimate son in 1486 whom the Dublin king could have been claiming to be. But the other two, the elder two brothers, may have had living sons. Edward had produced two sons um, with his consort Elizabeth Woodville. The younger one was called Richard, the elder one was called Edward, names both of which have been associated by the Tudor government with the Dublin King. So was he claiming to be one of these? Was he really one of these? George, Duke of Clarence, the middle brother, um, he also produced two sons, but the younger one died very, um, very soon after his birth. The only one that survived was Edward, Earl of Warwick. Again, the name Edward, a name associated with the Dublin King. <coughs> version two of the story of the Dublin King is the version that was put out in England by the Tudor government that was then in power. Henry VII, I haven't used the Society of Antiquaries, a rather beautiful portrait of him, you might like to look at that as well afterwards. Um, Henry VII claims that the Dublin king was an imposter. And the version of Tudor history which has been passed down to us suggests that the Tudor government claimed that this person's real name was Lambert Simnel. But we have to look at original sources. And if you look at original sources, you will find only one 
he resorts, mentions the name Lambert Simcock. It's mentioned in the parliamentary record, which I'll refer to again in a moment. And that name, Lambert Simnel, was then picked up by the um, early, uh, early 17th, uh, 16th century historian, Polydor Virgil, and recycled. And all subsequent historians have picked it up, what Polydor Virgil used, and recycled it. So this is why the name Lambert Simnel has come down to us very strongly. But if you look at contemporary Jewish you'll find that there is another one which says that although this person crowned in Dublin was a pretender, his real name was not Lambert Simnel, not Edward, not Richard, but John something, no surname. So there are two English Tudor versions of the story. One says that the boy's name was Lambert Simnel, but the other says that his real name was John. And we don't know which of those to believe, if either. <coughs> the account of the Lambert Simnel story as later recycled by Polydor Virgil and other historians says that Lambert Simnel came from Oxford. But again, it's very important to look at the original contemporary sources. And if you look at the Act of Parliament, which mentions the name Lambert Simnel for the Dublin King, it doesn't say that he came from Oxford. It says that he was taken to Oxford by a priest in order to be trained there how to pretend to be a prince. So again, we have two opposite versions of the story. If this boy's name really was Lambert Simnel, which we don't know, one version says he came from Oxford, but another version, the more accurate version, um, in terms of a historic source, says he was taken to Oxford and, and doesn't say where he came from. So we've got four names now for the Dublin King. You can see the questions are growing. I'm not sure whether the answers will, will grow in that one. Was he called Richard? Was he called Edward? Was he called Lambert Simnel? Or was he called John? Well, <coughs> let's look at the evidence for the royal name and number that the Dublin King actually used. If he's been Richard, presumably he would have been Richard IV, was he? But if he was Edward, was he Edward V? Or was he Edward VI? Historians have produced both versions of the Edward. Some historians have claimed that he was Edward V, or pretending to be Edward V. Others have said that he used the title Edward VI. So what is the truth? Well, first of all, let's have a little look at the story of the so-called princes in the tower, Richard and Edward. I don't like the name princes in the tower because it sort of brackets them together as though they had lived their lives together and they had the same fate at the end of their lives. Um, it sort of puts them in one package. Well, this is not true. For example, Edward, the elder of the two boys, was sent to be brought up at Ludlow Castle in 1473, <coughs> the year in which the younger prince, Richard, was born. So how much did they see of each other in childhood? Probably very little until they both ended up in the Tower of London in the summer of 1483. They may not have known each other very well. And in the case of Edward, Edward V, I would suggest 
that probably he died in July 1483. The evidence for that, first of all, we have this account written in December 1483 by Domenico Mancini, but I'm afraid I don't like the published version of this, which I think mistranslates some of the Latin. So um, I've altered the translation, and the bits that I've altered are in red. But Domenico Mancini was suggesting that death had carried Edward off. And the source of Domenico Mancini's information was Edward's doctor, Dr. John Argentine, who had been visiting the boy regularly during the summer of 1482 in the town of London. Now, why does a doctor visit a patient regularly? Social chit chat? Fake chat? Usually, surely, it's because the patient is ill. I think Edward was ill and was being regularly visited by his doctor. And what Dr. Argentine told Domenico Mancini was that um, Edward was confessing daily because a fear of death was pressing upon him. Does that mean that he feared murder or that he felt ill? If you look at the list of children of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, it's interesting to see the age to which they lived. We know that three of them died relatively young, Mary, Margaret, George. Possibly Edward also died relatively young. So maybe he was ill in the summer of 1483, and that is why he was being regularly visited by his doctor. Evidence for his death, I also discovered in the Colchester Oath Book, um, in the annual record for 1483, written on the 29th of September, Michaelmas Day, reference to the late son of Edward IV, King Edward IV. So the town clerk of Colchester, writing in September 1483, that Edward was dead. And the other piece of evidence to suggest that he died at about that time is the Requiem Mass, which was celebrated in the presence of Pope Sixtus IV at the Sistine Chapel in Rome on the 23rd of September 1483 for King Edward. So I am suggesting to you that Edward died. Not that he was killed, that he died. The other interesting thing is that after 1483, no one ever appeared claiming to be Edward IV. There was never a pretender claiming to be him. If we compare this with the story of the younger brother, Richard, as I said already, he was brought up not with his brother at Ludlow Castle, but at the Palace of Westminster with the rest of the royal family. And did he perhaps survive? Jean de Molinet suggested that where the elder brother, Edward, in the tower was melancholy, the younger brother was cheerful and spent time trying to persuade his miserable elder brother to dance. And an even more contemporary source, a letter written by Sir William, um, written uh, by Sir Simon Stallworth to Sir William Stronger on the 21st of June, 1483, recalled how Richard, the younger boy, had been handed over by his mother from Westminster Abbey, taken to the tower, where he is, blessed be Jesus, merrily. 
So the elder brother was miserable and melancholy and seeing his doctor a lot. But the younger brother was merry. The elder brother was ill and possibly died, but the younger brother possibly survived. And intriguingly, later we have more than one person, but one person in particular, claiming to be me. So nobody could claim to be Edward after 1483, but people did claim to be Richard. Now, in April 1483, when Edward IV died, what happened? Well, the big problem was the issue over who had been his wife. He'd been living for a long time with Elizabeth Woodville, who was the mother of his children, but there was also another lady, the Earl of Shrewsbury's daughter, Eleanor Talbot, and Robert Stillington, the Bishop of Bath and Wells, announced to the Royal Council in the summer of 1483, when they were preparing to crown the elder prince in the tower, Edward, we can't crown this boy, he's illegitimate because I married his father to Lady Eleanor Talbot before Edward IV made a secret marriage with Elizabeth Woodville. This evidence from Stillington was put to the three estates of the realm and ultimately to Parliament, and Parliament accepted it. And we have an act of Parliament that said in black and white, well, dark brown and white, <laughs> King Edward was and stood married and trust right to one Dame Eleanor. There is an act of Parliament that says that <coughs> Eleanor is the real queen. On the basis of this, the throne was retracted from the children of Edward IV and offered to his surviving younger brother, Richard III. Offered. Richard hadn't done anything to set this in motion. He may not have wanted it to happen, but he was suddenly confronted with it. And he accepted, and he was crowned king. And he and his wife, Eleanor of Warwick, Eleanor, Eleanor, I'm sorry, Anne of Warwick, and uh, Neville, uh, after their coronation, then went on a tour of the country. And on this royal progress, they were accompanied by a great friend of the, of the new king, Richard III, Sir John Howard, now Duke of Norfolk. Howard went with them as far as the shrine of Our Lady of Caversham in Reading. And then he was sent back to London to conduct a trial at Crosby's place, the house in Bishop's Gate, which uh, Richard had lived in as Duke of York, uh, as Duke of Gloucester. Sorry. Richard had lived in as Duke of Gloucester. And the trial that Howard conducted in Crosby's place was concerning people who were accused of having set off fires in the, in the vicinity of the Tower of London um, in an attempt to extract the sons of Edward IV from the Tower. We don't know who was behind this, but it's interesting that not very long afterwards, Richard III's former friend and now enemy and cousin, the Duke of Buckingham, started a rebellion, and the object of this rebellion was the restoration of Edward V. That was the first object of this rebellion. Now, it doesn't seem to me very logical um, for Buckingham to think that he could re-establish Edward V on the throne if he didn't have Edward V in his hands, if Edward V was a prisoner of Richard III. So it's also interesting that the person who later appeared, claiming to be the younger brother, Richard, 
states this is to be rescued by a lord. It doesn't say which lord. So what is the new Buckingham who was behind this scheme which had been going on in London in July 1483 to extract the boys from the town? And what had been the outcome of that scheme? Had it failed? Or had it succeeded? We don't know. There is no documentary evidence. Sorry. I pressed the arrow underneath the uh, lectern, so I can't move on to the next slide. But the key evidence in the case of the Dublin King is the evidence that shows what royal name and number he used. And this is it. It's a document um, from the York City Archives. It's a letter from the Dublin King to the Mayor of York in 1487 requesting entry to the city of York. And there is his name and number. King Edward VI. So the evidence is absolutely clear. Whether I'm right about Edward V when he died or not, whether Richard, the younger prince, had survived or not, is irrelevant. Because the Dublin King was using the name Edward and the number six. Therefore, he was not claiming to be either of the sons of Edward IV, he was claiming to be the son of the Duke and Duchess of Clarence, Edward Earl of Warwick. What is more, some Tudor sources say that he was claiming to be the Earl of Warwick. All the continental contemporary sources say that he was claiming to be the Earl of Warwick. And all the Irish sources say he was claiming so I think we can be quite clear on this. What is more, the continental and Irish sources say he was the Earl of Warwick. So where are we with that? We now have two conflicting life histories for the Earl of Warwick. The official account He's the son of the Duke and Duchess of Clarence, of course. His mother died soon after he was born, so he was left with just one parent. And then, of course, his father was executed by Edward IV in a rather interesting way in the Tower of London in order to avoid shedding royal blood. So the boy became an orphan at a very early age. He and his sister, later the Countess of Salisbury, were taken under the guardianship of their uncle, the King, Edward IV. Edward IV appointed his stepson, Thomas Gray, Marquess of Dorset, son of Elizabeth Woodhill, as a guardian of the Earl of Warwick. And because the Marquess of Dorset at that time was in control of the Tower of London, it's possible that the little boy was brought up there. And, and that he at that stage became the third prince in the tower. But if he didn't, he certainly did later. We'll see that in a minute. When Richard III came to the throne, he sent the Earl of Warwick and other young Yorkist princes and princesses up north, just outside York, to the castle of Sherlock Hutton. And for the next year or so, they lived there. But when Henry VII took power, he had them all brought back to London. He was particularly concerned about the Earl of Warwick. Why? Well, it concerns the fact that Henry VII was claiming to be the heir of the last Lancastrian King, Henry VI. And if we look at what Henry VI had done and said in 1470, it was that after his own immediate family, the next Lancastrian heir to the throne was George, Duke of Clarence. George, Duke of Clarence. 
jó, hogy talán átkülön elszakít a megkorszínű tanítsak. George hát szászik meg így egy exekutó, but his son was still alive. So in 1486, the Earl of Warwick, not Henry VII, but the Earl of Warwick, was the legitimate Lancastrian heir to the throne. Therefore, he was a big enemy in terms of uh, 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 in the eyes of Henry VII, and he needed to be kept under careful control. And Henry VIII was him under very careful control. His dear mother. Lady, Mar uh, Lady Margaret, Countess of Richmond. She was made governor of the Earl of Warwick. In 1486, when stories began to appear that there was another Earl of Warwick on the scene, Henry VII put his Earl of Warwick on display, public display at St. Paul's Cathedral, hoping that people would recognize and subsequently he imprisoned him in the Tower of London. So he definitely became the third <coughs> prince in the Tower then. But what is the problem with all this? How many people would have recognized the Earl of Warwick when Henry VII put him on display at St. Paul's Cathedral? How many Londoners had seen him on a regular daily basis? And indeed, how many people could recognize him at earlier stages in his life? When his father died, the Earl of Warwick had been three years old. So he didn't look like this portrait from the Ralph's Rose, which looks like a sort of uh, teenager. He would have looked more like that. <laughs> had Edward IV ever seen him before? We don't know. But possibly he had because he'd been his godfather. Now, he may have done that personally, or he may have done it vicariously. But if he'd done it personally, he had seen the Earl of Warwick before, um, when he was a few days old. Would he have recognized the child that the Clarence servant from Warwick Castle handed over to him after the Duke of Clarence had been executed? early in 1478? Or would he just have accepted what the Clarence servants were saying? This is a test for you. <laughs> How many children are you seeing more than once? One, two, three, none? I'll give you another look. You see, you've seen some little children, a few days old, and then you've seen some old children, maybe about three. Could you recognize anybody? The question is, was Edward IV able to recognize the child that was handed over to him? And the reason why this is important um, is a very significant element of this story. We have accounts of other people claiming to be lost royal children. Various people in the early 19th century claimed to be Louis, Louis XVII, the child who may have died in the temple or may have escaped. Various people claimed to be children of the Romanovs. Some of them claimed for a very long time all of them turned out to be false. All of them can be disproved. But there is something unique about the story of the um, Earl of Warwick, uh, which we need to look at now. The Duke of Clarence had Irish connections. He was governor of Ireland, lieutenant of Ireland for um, his brother Edward IV. But he'd also been born in Ireland at Dublin Castle and was brought up there for, um, in his early childhood, partly in Dublin, partly at Trinity Castle. And he was of Anglo-Irish descent through the Earl of Ulster. 
and even Irish royal descent. And his position on things was, well, I'm going to show you some things which were certain and some things which were probable. He was certainly an enemy of the Woodvilles. He may have, thought, may have known something about the story of Ellen Talbot and her marriage to Elizabeth. He was certainly the subject of a prophecy that said that after Edward IV, G will be king. And he may have been behind this prophecy. He certainly believed that his wife, the Duchess of Clarence, had been murdered. And he may have believed that his enemy, Elizabeth Woodville, was behind it. At any rate, he felt threatened. He trusted his sister, Margaret, Duchess of Burgundy, and he trusted his lieutenant in Ireland, his deputy in Ireland, sorry, the Earl of Kildare. So being threatened by the Woodvilles in England, feeling that his wife and possibly their second son had just been murdered, he wanted to protect his surviving son and heir, the Earl of Warwick. And so we know, because he was accused of this in the Acts of Atania, which led to his execution, he wanted to smuggle his son out of the country, either to Flanders or to Ireland. We know he was planning to do this. Now, this is something unique because nobody suggests that Louis XVII, somebody was smuggling out, one of his parents was smuggling out of France, or the Grand Duchess Anastasia, one of her parents was smuggling out of Russia. But here we have a case where we're told that the boy's father was trying to get him out of the country and substitute an imposter for him in the Clarence nursery. Yes. Oh, just go ahead and put that down. <laughs> just close it. Oh. Didn't notice it, sorry, because I was answering questions. Um, <coughs> now, I'm suggesting to you that um, in the end, Elizabeth Clarence went with Ireland, trying to smuggle his son there and uh, into the custody of the Earl of Kildare, um, and that maybe the boy was brought up in the Lewis Castle. What Margaret, George's sister, did later, after her brothers were all dead, was she knew about a boy in Ireland who might be her brother Clarence's son, and she sent for this boy and had him brought to her in Flanders, to her palace in Mechlin. And we have records recording the presence there in 1486 of Clarence's son and the fact that Margaret had given him presents. She also had in her palace at Mechlin another nephew, um, John de la Pole, Earl of Lincoln, who was the eldest and Francis Viscount Lovell, who had been a great supporter of Richard III. And these two talked to Margaret, talked to the boy she, um, she brought to her palace, acknowledged him as the Yorkist heir, and went with him and an army paid for by Margaret back to Ireland. And in Ireland, in Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin, the little boy was crowned King Edward V. And this is him on his state seal, which I found in the Irish National Library, the only surviving um, imprint of it. We have documents issued in Ireland in his name, some loose documents, and it seems that coins were issued in his name 
this coin called the Three Crowns brooch. This particular one from my collection has had the name slipped off it, unfortunately. But if you look at the printed, uh, 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 an engraved version, you can see that this one bears the name Edward. After the coronation, there was an invasion of England, <coughs> eventually the Battle of Stoke, and the Dublin King was defeated by Henry VII. And we then have a boy in Henry VII's kitchens turning the spit. And we're told that this was the Dublin King. But we're also told that he was aged about 17, which is intriguing because as uh, one Henry VII herald who had gone to inspect the Dublin King in Dublin while he was still there, had said that he was aged about 10. It's quite a big gap. So was the person in the kitchens the person who had been crowned in Dublin? Henry VII, in 1489, did a party for the Irish lords. He was by that time re-establishing his command of Ireland. He invited all the Anglo-Irish lords to England, and wine was served by, to them. And he had it served by Lambert Simnel, the boy who was working in his kitchen. Why? He seems to have hoped that the Irish lords would recognise this person and comment on the fact that they were being served their glasses, or rather tankards of wine, by the person they formerly had crowned king. But none of them did recognise him. And when Henry VII said something to try and encourage them to recognise him, one Irish lord said that he recognised this person as the Dublin king. But it was somebody who had opposed the coronation of the Dublin king and had probably never actually seen the boy in Ireland. An intriguing story. Against this, we have an account that Edmund Blackall, the younger brother of the Earl of Lincoln, later Earl of Suffolk, after the Battle of Stoke, had rescued the Dublin King, who had been captured after the battle, rescued him and smuggled him back to Flanders. I don't know how to evaluate that residence. So who was the Dublin King? How did he end all this? He was definitely claiming to be the Earl of Warwick, but was he the real Earl of Warwick? Or was he possibly a substitute child, one of the substitute boys that, he, that the Duke of Clarence was collecting together um, for his bit of intrigue? to try and get his real son and heir rescued and saved somewhere. Uh, uh, and was it a substitute that was sent to Ireland? But if it was a substitute, possibly he was brought up in Ireland by people who thought that he was the Earl of Warwick, understanding that his name was Edward. So he may, the boy himself, may have believed that he was the Earl of Warwick, even if he wasn't. Brought up by the Earl of <coughs> And the other question that we have is was the guy who worked in Henry VII's kitchens the same as the person who'd been crowned in Dublin? Or had the person crowned in Dublin been rescued by his cousin, um, Edmund de la Pole, and taken to Flanders? Questions, big questions. I don't have answers. But I think the big questions are much more important than just accepting the 500 years recycling of Polydor Virgil's version of the story that there was an imposter called Lambert Simnel. I think it's very important to get behind that and try and hunt for the truth. And how many people did you recognize from the pictures that I showed you? Two? Any advance on two? Three? Anybody?
but it's not less than two. Did it recognize any? One? Okay. The answer is one. <laughs> but it was just to show you how difficult it can be to, to recognize uh, at the age of three or four someone that you only saw when they were a teenager. Thank you very much.